were to her very clear, they were very logical, and they were highly effective when she practiced them. Mrs. Spalding worked with him two and a half years, taking classes and tutoring several of his patients. And then for 20 years, she worked at Massachusetts General Hospital and at Harvard Medical School and the Children's Memorial Hospital there. She worked with children, she taught, she put her experiences together, and finally with her husband, she wrote The Writing Road to Reading, which maybe some people have already seen. That's what it looks like. And this teaches phonics very systematically. Mrs. Spalding gives examples of how we teach children other tasks. She says, I don't give a book about phonics except to teach children the relationship between the spoken words and their written form. Then, children can learn to read and write anything they can say. We teach them how to swim, but do not just throw them in the water. We teach them how to play tennis, but we don't just hand them a racket. We try to develop understanding and controlled habits so children can perform well and enjoy what they're doing. These are the tools of learning. The key to reading, Mrs. Spalding relates, the key to reading is to teach directly with phonics and the elements of the English language by accurately combining the teaching of speech, writing, spelling, and reading. And you'll hear all of us talk about the fact that this method is multisensory. The core of the Spalding method is the teaching of the 70 basic phonograms. And you might wonder if this is all new to you, what are the phonograms? They are the basic sounds in the English, in English speech. A phonogram is a single letter or a fixed combination of two, three, or four letters. It's interesting to note that of the thousand words we use most often, 93% of them are phonetic or follow rules of spelling. And two-thirds of the phonograms of the 70 have only one sound. So I just have a few to just show you, one, one example from each. A, A, A. Er, the er of nurse.
Consequently, he acquires a mental discipline that serves him forever and in the rest of his education and life, and that promotes higher level thinking. In preschool, what I do is go through the 26 phonograms. They are introduced to the children, and we do it to both threes and fours, and they sit by direct instruction, and they love letting you know that they know those sounds, and they also look for the phonograms in their names. And so at the preschool level, that's how we introduce it, and they are eager to learn. Are there 70 as well? There's 70. I only showed you one of each example. So, so there's 70, 70 of these. And then there's also 20? No, there's no the 26 are just the alphabet ones that we're familiar with, just the alphabet. Do you use all 70 with preschoolers? No, just the 26. So when they're ready to recognize them in their names, and they are eager to do it. They, they accomplished it very well this year. So now Linda's going to elaborate on the handwriting part of this all these methods. <coughs> <coughs> Good afternoon. As important as phonograms are to the decoding and reading of words, a precise and proper understanding of handwriting is also necessary for the student to understand the connection of speech to print. The teaching of handwriting should precede reading from books, says Romualda Spalding. The title of her book, The Writing Road to Reading, is not just a creative play on words. Handwriting and phonograms create that road to learning and using the written language. This opens the road to reading to all typical students. From the very first day of school, no matter what the grade level, it is important to begin teaching the techniques of easy, legible and neat handwriting, using the phonograms, of course, for the practice. One of the greatest advantages about the Spalding Method, and one that I get so excited about, is the fact that it is multi-sensory. What I mean by this is that this language arts program makes constant use of the control by the mind. This simple principle uses the hearing of the phonogram sound, the seeing of the phonogram, the saying of the phonogram sound, and then, of course, the writing of it. Handwriting connects all of these elements. No other way of teaching the phonograms and the written spelling is so effective. As you know, all, all children want to su succeed in school, especially when it comes to spelling and reading. These skills are fundamental, and handwriting is the one which does most to unify and to also reinforce the others. Lessons on handwriting, along with learning the phonograms, can help relieve those frustrating tensions which can often paralyze a student from actually learning. The Spalding handwriting technique, though, is very disciplined, and it's very <coughs> regimented always striving for accuracy. For example, there is a precise way in which to grip the pencil, how to hold the paper, sit in a chair and at a desk, along with the direct way in which to form the letters and the numbers. As you can see in this picture, the student is sitting at her desk with her feet flat, her back is nice and straight, her head is tall, she has her booklet turned at an angle, and she is also holding the pencil with the three-fingered pencil grip that Romualdo Spalding recommends. I would also like to show you a brief example of how the manuscript letters are made. We use what's called the clock face, and we use reference points on the clock. For example, all of the clock letters begin in the two on the clock, and then we will reference other points. Uh, take your pencil and start at the two, go over to the 10, down to the eight, and stop at the four. We also use five different straight lines. The short line, tall line, sneaky line, slanted line, and horizontal line. Using a combination of the clock or 
the straight lines, these various combinations form the manuscript lowercase and capital letters. Mrs. Spalding states, for many years since I learned the basic elements of this method, I have been able to prevent beginners who were clearly tending towards dyslexia from developing that great handicap. She has also rescued many older children from the frustrating failures to which dyslexia condemned them. I have personally experienced this very concern with one of my former kindergartners. She had attended kindergarten at another school for a whole year before enrolling in ours. Her mother called me and was greatly concerned and she felt that her daughter was dyslexic. All of her letters were backwards and not just the typical B's and D's which children sometimes flip at that age, but all of her letters were backwards. She wrote her name and other words backwards and when she came to school last year to me in kindergarten, she could not identify any lowercase or any capital letters. I told her mother not to worry just yet, that we're using a wonderful language arts program, and let's give it a chance to work. I am happy to report that through much phonogram and handwriting work, she is writing neatly and with great accuracy. This is an average student. This is an example from her spelling notebook, and I want you to notice the handwriting. And as you can see, it is very neat, it is very precise, and it is very accurate. Did you know that even small errors can prevent children from learning to write easily, <coughs> legibly, and neatly? If letters are made incorrectly, they are mentally pictured incorrectly as well. Let me say that again. If letters are made incorrectly, they are mentally pictured incorrectly. This is a serious cause of failure in both reading and written spelling. As I've already mentioned, it can develop dyslexia or other perceptual handicaps. Students require careful and continued teaching of all the handwriting techniques. From the very beginning, students need to be taught to follow directiveness. Success in these writing skills develops pride in a student's work and builds his self-confidence. And you will find this to be true time and time again. The instructional techniques found in the Spalding Method are consistent with the Carnegie Mellon and University of Washington findings about the way children learn. New evidence now indicates that the ease of handwriting has a positive, positive effect on students' ability to organize information and to express themselves clearly in compositions. I believe wholeheartedly in the Spalding Method, including the detailed formation of the child's handwriting. And I, as a teacher, I'm a stickler. I demand accuracy. And my little kindergartners will practice and practice until they master the handwriting skill. Now, some parents or some educators may question this, the true necessity of all of this demanding handwriting. Is it really necessary? Well, my response to them is Romalda Spalding's words. Many teachers and parents fail to realize the importance of teaching the correct formation of the letters from the very start of teaching the written language. Unless children write correctly, they do not see the correct symbols for the sounds. Unless they write correctly, they do not see the correct symbols for the sounds. And motor patterns, once formed, are very difficult to correct. The overall summary of handwriting in the Spalding Method can be summed up in just six little words. Accurate handwriting connects speech to print. And that is a definite bonus that you want for your child or student as he begins to spell and write, as we will now hear from Mrs. Betty Garwood. Mm -hmm. The application of the phonograms and the spelling rules to learn to spell words is the method which unites the spoken sounds of the English words to their written forms. <coughs> this is taught by analyzing words a list referred to as the heirs list. 
this list of 1,700 words is listed according to frequency of use in our language. These words include, include practically every pattern of English spelling. And Mrs. Spalding states that upon completion of this list, the achievement of mastery equates to mastery of most English words. The words are taught by the students writing from the teacher's dictation only. The teacher teaches them to use the phonograms and the rules of spelling, which apply to each word. The teacher dictates the words in the order given in the errors list. She gives the whole word as spoken in conversation, not syllabicated, and uses it in a meaningful sentence. This serves as a standard for the types of sentences the students are expected to use at first orally and then in written form. The students do not see the word until they and the teacher have written it. The class in unison says aloud the first phonogram of a one-syllable word and writes it. As each student writes the sound, he says aloud softly the next phonogram and writes it until the word is finished. For example, let's take the word keep. I would say the word is keep. I will keep you in my prayers. Keep. The student would say softly and write keep. For words of more than one syllable, the class says the first syllable aloud and starts to write it. Before finishing it, they say aloud the next syllable and write it, etc., until the word is finished. Let's take the word coffee. The word is coffee. I need strong coffee. <laughs> coffee. And they would write cough. Coffee. After each word is written, the class reads it aloud and each student checks for accuracy. Students read the lists of words aloud and silently. Spelling rules are taught when a word illustrates it. In this way, students understand the rule and apply it as it is used. I have Andrew's spelling notebook here, and I'll just open to the first page. The first word in the errors list is me, and it is spelled, and the phonogram is marked and underlined. And the rule is next to it, and it's rule four. Initially, I teach the rule to the children, but after a while, they just know this by heart and, and record it and say it aloud without any prompting from me. It would sound like this, me, mm, e, me, rule four. A, E, O, and U usually says A, E, O, and U at the end of a syllable. You're welcome to look at these a little later and see the rules that are notated throughout the notebook. The Spalding method uses 29 spelling rules. We have a sample up here from Christina's spelling notebook of 20 words that she has recorded in her spelling notebook. They are written neatly. The phonograms are underlined and marked. She has syllabicated the words read these words silently and aloud. This is a lesson from a little later on in the year for first grade. First graders begin with 30 words per week, which have, are recorded in this spelling notebook. By February, they have 544 words in their notebooks and have used each word <coughs> in a sentence. By March, they are spelling words like mountain and breakfast. The first year I taught this method, I asked my students at this point if these words were difficult. And they said, Mrs. Garwood, these words are not hard if you know the phonograms. <laughs> the average grade level score for spelling for a first grade class at this time is third grade, fourth month. Andrew Kern, co-author with Dr. B's Classical Education, called the writing road to reading 
the best spelling program the world has ever seen. Indeed, Mrs. Spalding says that if the method given in this book is taught, the child obtains in the spelling lesson the basic knowledge of how the written language works. And he can figure out almost any word as he comes to it. The spelling notebook itself has a remarkable psychological impact on the student. <clears throat> Students see a cumulative record of their daily accomplishments. The notebooks, the notebook has hundreds and hundreds of correctly spelled words. And that in itself is a remarkable achievement. It also shows a progression of their handwriting through the year, as well as being used as a spelling reference book, which students use as they write sentences or paragraphs. Thus, the spelling notebook serves as a practice, motivational, and reference device at the same time. As I mentioned earlier, the writing program begins with sentences, sentences, sentences and transfers to paragraphs quickly. Students write a sentence for each word that is entered into the spelling notebook. Students are instructed in writing declarative sentences as well as interrogative, imperative, and exclamatory. Of course, grammar is included and in taught daily. As they master this beginning writing, the results carry over into all subject areas. Here's another example of a daily writing assignment for 10 spelling words that Michaela has done in second grade. She's used each spelling word, underlined it, and identified what kind of sentence it is. I'll give you a moment just to look at that. Not down to the end, the clincher, of course, is sentence 9 and 10. Chandler, Austin, and Zachary are in jail. <laughs> but they are forgiven because she said, Jesus shed his blood for us. <laughs> I personally like them too. Yeah, me too. Maybe because I have two boys. <laughs> this is a very normal example of the sentences that students write. We have some students who are very serious and some who are a little more playful and a blend of, of everything. An observation that I have made from teaching the Spalding method is that this phonetic approach gives the student power over the words. By that I mean that the student is not afraid to read anything. A difficult history or science book, the newspaper, an encyclopedia, the Bible, the dictionary. Students have a strong interest in words, and several first and second grade students keep a dictionary on their desktop to look up new words. Not only are the students quizzed daily and weekly on new and review words, but they are also tested monthly with the Morrison McCall spelling scale. This is a booklet of eight standardized 50 word tests of equal difficulty selected from the errors list. The grade scores for each test run from first grade beginning of the year to grade 13 first year of college. This book booklet lists tables which give the grade equivalent for the number of words spelled correctly on each test. The class average for spelling of students using the Spalding program is usually two grade levels above their grade level. For example, results from one of our second grade classes showed at the end of the year, the class average in spelling for second graders to be fifth grade, seventh month. The third grade class average in spelling was sixth grade, beginning of the year. Spelling scores are usually lower than reading scores in the United States. Mrs. Spalding says spelling is harder than reading because in spelling, all knowledge must come from the mind. Written spelling taught skillfully and logically
logically and far enough can upgrade all children's speech and reading. Two basic elements for education. And now, Darla Stroop will continue with reading. How we'll see how the teaching and learning of the phonograms, the uh, spelling and writing, and the handwriting will lead us into the fabulous world of reading. The ability, along with the desire to read well-written books that expand the students' horizons and knowledge of life is one, if not the major goal of language teaching. This interest should begin with the first book in grade one and grow with the reading lesson in every subsequent grade. Many schools try to teach by the eclectic method. That is, by all methods, on the theory that children <coughs> are best by one method and some by another. There are, in fact, but two methods. The whole word, word or look-say method, and phonic analysis. The whole word, or look-say method, has cased such a high percentage of reading failures among intelligent children that it is now being nominally replaced by the all methods or the eclectic approach. In actual practice, this comes down to the whole word method with some phonics gradually added on over several years. Well, very few teachers have had a full course on phonics. Even if a teacher did know and had time to teach two such different methods in her class, it is not expected that her children could use one method without confusing it with the other method. Because it utilizes all sensory approaches, the Spalding method is so broadly based that it is, that it is effective for all pupils, even the children who have a photographic type visual memory, which enables them to make a start in reading by the means of the whole word approach. As you've heard already, English has the 70 common uh, phonograms, 26 letters, and 44 fixed combinations of two, three, and four letters. In essence, learning phonograms leads to spelling. Spelling leads to writing, and writing leads to reading. Students read and uh, write and read the original sentences to show their meanings. This then would be their first reading. Within about two months, the 150 most used words that have been studied in the written spelling lessons. The beginning classes are ready to start reading from books, preferably classical books, well-written storybooks of interest, which educate and stir their imagination, such as the classic stories. They are not dependent on the basal readers which would then incorporate a highly controlled vocabulary. The learning of the spelling words by writing them from dictation connects at once the written symbols to their spoken sounds. All normal children can learn because every avenue into the mind is used. They hear the teacher say the word, then each child himself hears himself say it, each child hears himself say it as he writes the sound, and he uses his mind in saying it and in directing his hand to write it. Let me say that again. Each child hears himself say each sound while he uses his mind in saying it and directing his hand to write it. No other way can fix sooner or more securely in his memory the words he can write and read at a glance. This teaching enables the many children who inherit to some degree the tendency to reverse or to confuse the left to right sequence of letters to overcome this handicap. If a child's oral or visual recall of letters is weak and vacillating, then the other, re the, the other three avenues to his mind reinforce it and strengthen it. Those few who can remember a word by its general configuration find this phonetic approach fully as good for reading and even better for spelling and writing. They need less time on spelling, but each day's new words are taught to the whole class. All must produce. They do mental work to, well, I'm sorry, they do mental work to write and read, and problems of inattention vanish 
under each child's desire to learn. The average first grade class knows the 70 photograms, writes about 700 words before June, and reads many times that many. The second and upper grades learn more rapidly by the same method. Reading is centered on the interesting books of real literature and the thought expressed by the author. Fine books fill the minds of children with a wealth of knowledge, of character and philosophy, of history and science, of humor and wit. Good comprehension by use an essential question in the literature can be accomplished with, with the use of the standard test lessons in the reading that Spalding requires. These comprehension lessons teach children to hold their minds on what they read. Averaging the scores on 10 lessons give a really strong indication of the reading comprehension grade level. For example, the average grade placement for our second grade readers at the end of the school year was fifth grade second month. The third grade average was sixth grade first month. This was very exciting for all of us. In short, good books need to be savored for the beauty of the language and the sharing of the experiences the characters portrayed. Some of the books we read this year were Alice in Wonderland, Homer Price, Charlie the Chocolate Factory, Misty of Chincoteague, and Robin Hood, and that was in the third grade. In the fourth grade, we read The Wind in the Willows, The Hobbit, Beowulf, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, and many more. The students enjoyed each of these books immensely. This summer, we sent home The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and Prince Caspian um, to the fourth and fifth grades, respectively, and that, those will be the first books that we will teach in the fall. The students love to read out loud with expression. They are so excited to see which book and what they will be doing next. And we just really have a wonderful time with reading at Mount Hope. In closing, we want you to know that our school is full of typical students. We have children who range from struggling. We have average students. We have very bright students. And the great thing about this program is that it works for all of them. It challenges all of them. That's why our entire staff is so excited about the Spalding Method, and we're also very committed to this method, and that's why it works. Please seek us out during the conference if you have any questions. I think we have a few minutes, too, to answer some questions for you. Afterwards, you are also welcome to come down and we have brought a few of our students' uh, spelling notebooks and some of the test lessons that you are welcome to look at as well. Thank you so much for coming. Yes? Um, would you be able to give us an example of what your daily schedule would be for one week with one set of words? In, in kindergarten, we begin with the handwriting techniques and the phonographs. And that takes about probably 45 minutes to an hour in the morning. As the year progresses in kindergarten, I introduce the spelling words. And we have 12 spelling words a week. And I do anywhere from three to four a day in the method that Mrs. Merwood explained. Uh, and that is about enough, that is another 45 minute block of time. So in the morning, it's probably about 45 minutes to an hour for kindergarten time. Uh, towards the end of the year, the kindergartners begin writing their very own sentences. And that can take an additional 15 to 20 minutes for three or four words. And then it's longer than that in the upper grades. I teach first and second, and I would say that most of the morning is spent on our language arts program. In fact, Mrs. Spalding recommends that you spend three hours on this. We obviously are working on the, the basis, the phonograms, and then we start with the spelling words. Each class is different. It depends on how they come in. This last year, I began spelling words with my first graders the second week. 
and they began sentences right away because they had progressed so far in Linda's class. As the year goes on, however, they're able to whip through those sentences and on to reading, which is what they love. But I would say that we spend three hours a day on the total reading, language, art, spelling, phonogram time. We do introduce 30 new words a week. I, in first and second grade, I introduce 10 a day. And we write sentences for those. That just seems to work easier for our time frame and our schedule. And we do review words as well after we get a little further into the heirs list. So you would introduce words, say, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? That's correct. And do you have like a review on Thursday of some kind of test on Friday? That's true. We do our, in, in first and second grade, we do our 30 word test on Friday. On Thursday, we're still doing a quiz on our 10 words from Wednesday. Okay, so, you, so you introduce 10 words and the next day you quiz those and introduce that's, 10 more. That's correct. Um, and, and then as we go a little further through the year, we're constantly reviewing. We're back to the end of that spelling notebook and we're constantly reviewing. And there's no real set way on that. That's how it, how it has seemed to work, work for us in our schedule at school. But you know, you could probably do 8-8 eight, eight and 7-7 seven and seven or, or however it would work in your I, I would just like to I, say, I, I'm sorry. Well, just so you know, in third and fourth, I introduced all the words on Monday, the 30 words to the third and fourth graders on Monday, and I get test on Wednesday, <coughs> and then if they pass the test, they just shake it before I do that. So you, then maybe Tuesday, they write your sentences, or they write your sentences? They write, I don't do the sentences. Oh, I do other forms of writing. Okay. But then you like to see that. When you say, Scott, what do you do? You do if they don't finish their sentences during the day in the classroom, does that double as homework? That's correct. That's correct. Yes. And just one other thing I'd like to say for any administrators who may be in here, and that is if you choose to do this program, you really need to send your teachers to the Spalding class. It is a two week, very intensive, um, three hour college credit class. And the other thing is, if you really love your teachers, you need to provide an aid to help them <laughs> with the constant correcting and tutoring that goes with the, this program. Yes. What is your plan for any coming students or new students that arrive second or third down the road by pandemic? It's a great question, and this has happened to us as we have grown. Um, Darla, do you want to take that? That, that would be fine. We, we start them right back at the basics. They have to have their cards. We make them get their cards and we tutor them. We even, we, um, we use all of our services to tutor them. We need them to know every one of them. Um, and so I, I had a child that started in third grade in January. He was right with the children in about two to three weeks. He did work very fast, of course. But uh, he was right with the other children in about two to three weeks, doing the very same words and um, that. If, if so, we, sorry. If, if we know we're having a, a child, they've registered earlier. We've tutored in the summer. We've right. tutored before and after school. Um, yeah, so they have to be caught up at that point. When you test, is that actually putting it into their spelling book? Is that what you mean by the testing, or is that that separate call? that you do on Friday? On Friday, it's a separate paper test. Okay, when do you actually have them put it in the notebook? They put it in the notebook Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or as Darla says, on Monday. With, so with, with the, the markings. Immediately, immediately yeah. goes in the notebook. With yes. the markings, the way she was doing it. I was just going to add, another day, they see immediately what they've done. So it's corrected immediately, you're not spending time going back and doing that. So that's the day, if there are any yeah. mistakes, yeah. We look at that at recess, and they have that word correct, written correctly in their spelling notebook. So they erase it correct, or they correct it right? They erase it correct. Yes. How long have you been in this program? Question number one. Six, uh, four years. Four years. Number two is, am I correct to assume that it's a pre-K through four program? That is where our school is right now. We're adding fifth grade this year, and yes, that's correct. Okay, pupil teacher ratio? One to 20. Do you have a para for each classroom? We do. Okay. Teaching assistants. Yes. Can this be adapted for preschool? 
Yes. I just started it basically this year. And what I did was, in my own thinking from preschool before and teaching before, I thought, well, I can't do this too soon. So I'll wait until December. Well, next year it's going to change. We're doing it right away in September, October. Because I started with the, with the letters that were in their names, which they most of them already know. And that's what we've done. We've done a lot of different things. And we, what was said earlier about them writing and getting it correctly, for them to just write their name correctly, that takes away from them learning it wrong and going on to kindergarten, we have to do it over again. So whether they're staying at our school or not, that's the way we, we teach them how to do it. What do you do with the child in kindergarten or the child in second grade that does not keep up with the pace that you're going? Just doesn't get the B going this way or doesn't get the spelling thing on the it's a good and question. They can't keep it up. And that and that happens. 